Today we're going to get the Flex operating system up and running on this Altair 680 computer. If you haven't watched the earlier videos in this series, I'd really recommend watching them first, especially the previous two videos where we actually show how we got a disk drive hooked up to this Altair 680. To make it easier to find, I put a link to the playlist for this series in the information down below the video. Now in the 6800, 6809 world, the Flex operating system played the same role that CPM played over in the 8080Z80 world. And that is it allowed a variety of different machines from different manufacturers to all have a common software execution environment. And this meant the same program could run on a variety of different machines without being changed. And it gave the same operator user interface experience across different machines as well. And it's this little bit of standardization that really helped a rapid growth in the microcomputer industry in the late 70s and early 80s. Now the uh, Flex operating system came out in early 1978. It was written by a company called Technical Systems Consultants, or TSC, and it was written specifically for this um, Southwest Technical 6800 computer. And there was two slightly different versions of the uh, Flex 1.0 operating system. One was geared primarily towards a dual 8-inch drive that Southwest offered. Uh, it's primarily geared towards the business market. It's quite expensive. That never sell, sold very well. The other version was for their five and a quarter inch mini floppy system, the MF68. And that one sold a lot. And that's really what got the Flex operating system out in the hands of the public. Um, that particular version was often called mini Flex because it was the version for the mini disk drives. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, version one operating system of Flex corresponded, as you might expect, to the CPM version ones, like CPM 1.4 was extremely common. Um, and they had a lot in common in terms of capability. About a year later, Flex 2.0 came out, and as you might expect, it was kind of in line with the kind of things that CPM 2, CPM 2.2, you're probably familiar with, was doing. Uh, there was a Flex 3, but it had nothing to do with, you know, keeping up or being similar to CPM 3. As I've demonstrated in other videos, Flex 2 already had a good mix of CPM 2 and CPM 3 in it. Um, you might want to Google, or not Google, but look in YouTube for my um, 6800 series. And there's two or three in there where I go into Flex and one where I compare Flex and CPM. And that'll give you a better idea of what's going on. But um, then Flex kind of moved over to the 6809 world because that processor had come out and it was much more powerful than the 6800. And that one was called Flex um, 09 in the beginning. And then later it became a Flex 3 something or other, but it was 6809. So it got confusing. But anyway, back in the 6800 world, um, the best operating system for us to use for this Altair 680 is going to be the MiniFlex or Flex 1.0 for a couple of reasons. One, it's the only version of Flex that did not require RAM above 8000 hex. In our Altair 680, that is a hardware limitation we have as we can only get the uh, 32K of RAM in here. That's these two lower boards. And so we want our RAM to all be under 8,000 hex. So that's important for us. The other thing is that that uh, MiniFlex also uses 128 byte sectors, which is what this disk drive uses. Not that that's a showstopper, but that makes it more convenient for us as well. So what we're gonna do is get Flex 1.0 for the mini disk drive, MiniFlex, up and running on this computer. <clears throat> so now, as you saw, we had 16K of RAM in here, and we also have our uh, UIO board here on the top. That's a standard board made by MITS for the 680 and it gives us our parallel interface through these two ports over to the disk drive. Now the reason a disk drive can be run with parallel ports is because this particular drive has a disk controller built inside it and that allows this drive to be connected to almost any computer even if the controller was never made for it which is why this was such a handy um, solution for getting a disk drive working with this 680. Otherwise, there was never a controller made for the 680 as we went into in detail in other videos. So uh, this was a good find to be able to have this disk controller or disk drive that we could actually use with the 680. Now, one thing we're going to do new today is take advantage of this 6850 serial port. It actually connects over here and I've got it running to the back port. And we're going to use that as the printer that uh, Flex defines. Flex defines a printer for some commands and we'll demonstrate that in a bit. You're going to want to stick around to the end of the video somehow because the printer we're going to use today, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be this uh, World War II Model 15 Teletype. 
and it's uh, it's just a pleasure, a joy to listen to and watch. Uh, it's kind of odd after watching the teletype and all the previous videos to think a teletype could be pleasant and uh, soothing to listen to, but trust me, this one is. It's almost ASMR-like. Uh, I find it quite mesmerizing, but uh, at least go to the end of the video and watch that if you don't want to watch the rest of it. That's going to be our system printer for today. All right, so uh, that takes care of the introduction. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we went about getting Flex 1.0, which is Mini Flex for the Southwest Technical 6800. Let's see how we got that ported over to the six Altair 680 so that we could run Flex on this computer. Since Flex 1.0 was specifically written for this Southwest Technical 6800 computer, it wasn't really designed with the idea of porting it to other hardware to begin with. However, it was written in a well-organized way so that doing it is not that difficult. And there is a uh, advanced programmer's manual that contains enough information to help us figure out how to make this work over on the Altair 680. So first of all, we know that Flex itself is memory resident and it takes 4K of memory up at uh, 7,000 to 8,000 hex up there at the top of the RAM that we'll have. And the uh, disk drivers, the low level disk drivers are in the top page of that memory. So they start at 7F100 and at 7F100 is a jump table to the low level routines for your disk, like a read sector, write sector, select disk, stuff like that. And those points are all documented in that advanced programmer's manual. Down at 7100 hex in Flex is a large jump table that allows programs to access the various functions and features of Flex. Most of those point right back into Flex to call the routines to do the work. However, I noticed that three of them jumped into the swap bug or the Southwest Technical Monitor ROM um, to do console I.O., character in, character out. So obviously those three entry points in the table we're going to have to patch to jump to uh, routines that will write to do console I.O on the Altair 680. So those two main things should get us going, patching the jump table for console I.O. and then also putting in our driver. Now our driver should be pretty easy to write for the disk because we've got all those routines written and we basically just have to tweak them to match the calling convention and the return convention that the, the Flex driver expects. Now to do that we're going to use the workspace-based software development environment I created in that last video to uh, write those routines and then we'll be able to patch them into Flex. Now to get a copy of Flex we're going to have to use this 6800 computer. We'll get Flex 1.0 up and running and then use the punch command to actually write a memory image of Flex out to disk for us, excuse me, out to uh, paper tape for us and that will be our starting point. And then over in our 680 workspace I'll load that in and I'm actually going to save that image to a workspace so that from then on I can just load and save it as I need um, quickly on disk like we've seen in the previous video. All right, let's get back to the 680 now and take a look at the disk drivers. So I've taken the tape that I punched over on the Southwest Technical 6800 computer that has the memory image of Flex in S record format and I've loaded that into this machine. And it's a, it's a long, lengthy process, and so I don't want to have to do that again. So what we're going to do going forward is save it as one of the workspaces like you saw in that last video. All right, and so it's up at 7,000 uh, 7, to 8,000 hex, and what I'd like to do is just write that to a workspace. But as you recall, uh, the workspaces are only 24K, so that upper um, 4K of RAM is not saved, and that will be a good thing as we'll see in just a minute. Um, so what I've done as part of this workspace is I've written a little routine that is a mover. So it's a 3DF100 or 3F100 and it can either move the flex image up to 7,000, that would be after I loaded it, or in this case down to 4,000. So it's at 7,000 to 8,000 right now, I'll move it down and now it's been moved down into the workspace. So now I can save the workspace, so jump to FD03, save, let's, let's make it workspace 4. And so now I have a uh, copy of Flex 1.0 as it resides in RAM in a Southwest Technical 6800 saved in Workspace 4. And I can load this anytime I want just by jumping to FD00 and loading Workspace 4. It's down at 4000 right now, so I'll jump to 3F00, which is part of this workspace, and move it up. And so now I have the 6800 version of Flex from the Southwest Technical up there in memory. 
Now what I want to do is put my drivers into it and then patch some I.O. routines so that it will work with the MITS console instead of the Southwest Technical console. And I have that in Workspace 3. So I'll load that. Jumping to 010A, um, enters the editor but without erasing it. And so here you can see I have my start of my routines for doing a Miniplex driver for the Altair. So what we want to do is assemble this. This will assemble into RAM at 7F100. Let's look for that jump table. We'll search for the word jump. Type 22 lines. Um, all right, so it starts at 7F100. And there's a read sector routine, write sector, verify sector, restore a track zero, and select drive. Those are the entry points that Flex wants in the low level disk driver. So I have all of those in here, and when I assemble this, it will go into what's already in RAM and overwrite that. So now instead of having the Southwest technical disk routines, it'll have mine. All right, so in addition to the disk routines, I figured this would be a good place to put the patches I have to make to the, um, the memory image as well, in addition to what we're doing with the disk driver. So let me find patches. Okay, so at 7109, remember I said the jump table is 700? So there was an in-character routine that jumped to the swap bug. That reads a character from the console. So I'm gonna have that jump to my own routine. That's gonna be in a prom eventually, and we'll see that in a minute. And a jump to output character is at the next vector. That is doing output of one character. We're gonna go to our prom again that I'm writing. And then down a little ways at 136 is another output character. This is the one that gets moved in and out for whenever it wants to run the printer. We'll see that later. Um, I, I've obviously already played with this and the demo I'm showing you, I've already proven it works. And as I've worked on this, I've realized there's a number of things in the memory image of Flex that uh, are Southwest technical specific, specific that I didn't think of or aren't mentioned in the manual. So for example, um, it checks the status of the console to see if something was typed while a program's running, um, and it actually goes and directly accesses the hardware to do that. Well, that hardware is in a different spot, the ACIA, the UART, and so what I've had to do is go in, basically what I did is I went in and did a, I wrote a search routine to look for any address over 8,000, and when I found those, I realized I had something to fix. So the UART is up at 8,004 in the uh, Southwest Technical, so I had to put it where our ACIA is. This is pointing to F1000 where it is in our Altera. So there's two of those patches. Um, and then there's also a patch where it checks to see if an ACI is present. I had to patch that to um, always be true as well. Let's go to the next 22 lines. All right, now the other problem I found is that it used the memory on the CPU board of the 6800 for stack. That's a little 128 byte RAM. Um, and it's at, it's at A0, zero it's a thousand through a zero seven f um and i don't have that in the mitts and so i had to patch wherever the stack was loaded so there's two places the stack was loaded and i'm pointing it to um basically at the very end of ram up at seven fff is pointing to the stack i'm using um, and then also there was two places where the three places where the maximum sector mask and the actual compare for maximum sector and track were wrong so we've gone from a 35 track disc with 18 sectors to a 77 track disc with 26 sectors. So here you can see I had to patch a new max sector, a new max track, and then this was a mask of 3F, I had to change it to 7F because the track numbers get higher. All right, and then the last patch was the monitor command, MON. It's one of the, there's only two intrinsic commands in Flex. One of them is mine and it just jumps back to the monitor. The address for the 6800 monitor in swap bug is of course different than the Altair 680, so I had to patch that as well. All right, so in the end, there was a number of things that had to be patched. It wasn't really made to be ported to other machines. If you left it on the Southwest and just did a different disk driver, it was just the disk driver code. But, but since I'm going to a different machine, there's quite a few things I ended up having to find. All right, so let's go ahead and assemble this on the first pass. And again, when I assemble this, it's gonna go into memory. I have the, the option memory set. So as, when I assemble it, it will end up in memory. We'll take a look here, you'll see that go by. 
there's the opt-in that'll put in memory and here we can see the entire routine We're coming up on the jump table here a read sector seek uh, errors had to be converted to a format that it expect there's a write sector verify disk restore drive select and then here are all the patches so every one of these is going into memory now, overwriting what was there. So what's in memory now is Flex ready for this 680, the memory image of it. So let's go out and run it. The cold start entry point for Flex is 7100. You heard it hit the disk, and we're at the prompt for Flex. I mean, that's the cold boot message. Hitting the disk is it was looking for a file called startup.txt. That is like an auto exec.bat file. And we're to our prompt. And this is pretty darn exciting, except I now realize I've got a lot of work ahead of me. Um, there's nothing on this disk. I mean, you can't do a catalog. Um, in in uh, CPM, save is an intrinsic command. So if you could get something into memory, like with the load command, you could at least save a program or two out to disk to help you get this going. But save isn't even an intrinsic command. So we've got some work ahead of us to try to figure out how to get this thing bootstrapped. A lot of chicken and egg problems. And on top of that, we have to um, format this disk in a way, a second level format, so that it's ready for use by Flex. And we need a boot ROM, and we need a cold start loader on the disk, um, and a number of other things. And so this excitement is short lived. There's a lot to do. So even though I can now quickly load a Altair 680 version of Flex into RAM, jump to it, and see it up and running, I'm really a long ways from actually running Flex where I boot it from disk and have Flex commands on disk that I can use. One of the first things I'm going to have to do is write a format routine called new disk. New disk is present on every Flex distribution and it is custom to whatever disk controller um, it was designed for. So the first thing new disk does is a low level format of the disk. Um, now in our case this controller can't do a low level format as we described in the previous video. You had to buy pre-formatted disks. So you don't have to do that part. The second thing new disk does is then go back and do a second stage format where it creates the structures needed by Flex in order to use the disk. Now the first four bytes of every sector are used by, Flip, uh, by Flex to maintain a linked list of all the sectors that belong to a file or all the sectors that belong in the free list of sectors. Now when we create a new disk, the entire disk is free sectors. So new disk has to go through and make that link list where all sectors hook to each other. Now track zero is a special case. Track zero is used for a few different things. The first two sectors on track zero contain the cold bootloader. The job of that is to go out and load flex from a file in the file system into RAM and then jump to it. So Flex is actually a normal file on your disk that you can look at and copy and change if you want. Um, CPM, if you recall, actually had the CPM image on the boot tracks just as a binary image ready to load until CPM3. And then finally in CPM3, to give themselves more flexibility, the CPM image was actually a file out in the file system like Flex is doing here already. So that is a bit more difficult to do, but it is a more flexible solution. Now that cold bootloader is um, loaded by a boot prompt. So we're going to have to write a boot prompt as well that goes out and loads sectors one and two and jumps to them so that the cold boot loader can then go out to the file system and load flex, uh, and which in turn then can run and we're up and running. Except then we have to figure out how to get all of the flex commands and files onto the disk because flex by itself really can't do anything because virtually every command other than like I showed you the monitor command is um, loaded off a disk. It's not intrinsic. So we have a real chicken and egg problem as to how to get files onto the disk as well. Um, and we'll address that in just a bit. All right, so the new disk routine is what I did <coughs> first and I could run, <coughs> excuse me, and I could run that from our workspace concept. And in the end, new disk is a program on the disk, so it runs under flex. So what I would do is load the flex workspace and then load my new disk routine and let it format the disk with the flex required structures. Um, along with writing the uh, bootstrap loader to sectors one and two, it also creates a system, system information record in sector three. That's where it points to the start and the end of the free list and tells you how many sectors are in it. 
And then the remaining sectors on that track are all part of the directory. And those are hooked together with their own uh, linked list. So that all has to be created by new disk. So once I did that, then I could write to it. Um, and it's new disk's job to write the cold bootloader out to the disk. And so it did that as well. Um, of course, I had to write the cold bootloader. But the cold bootloader, there is a uh, example given and the one you write for your own system is very close to that other than the actual sector read write routines and same with new disk you can use a lot of the code that they give in the sample one um, it's still a lot of work but it's not like you're starting from scratch with no hint of what to do um, and at that point I was ready to start writing files to the disk but the question is how on earth do you write a file to a disk you can't even run the save command because it has to be on disk as well so the trick I used there was the fact that you can create something called user commands that are in memory. And so I took the save command in memory over on the Southwest Technical, punched it to tape as an S record file, and then brought it over here to the Altair, loaded it into memory, and then punched in the bytes to tell um, uh, Flex that it had an intrinsic command called save, and pointed it to the real save command that I put into memory. Then I was able to use it to save itself. So in the end, those steps I just described put one file out on the disk called save.command. And at this point, anything I could get into RAM, I could then save to disk. So the first thing I did was go ahead and save the flex image out to disk. I think I called it dos.sys. That's a fairly common nomenclature for that. And then the question is how do you get all the other files on there? Well, back in the day, this was a real problem. Um, I had a friend that worked at a software company that made tax software, and they would distribute it for all sorts of different CPM machines. But all those disk formats were quite different. There was no standardization in how disks were laid out in the CPM day. That didn't really occur until the IBM PC was really well established. And there was, therefore, no way for them to copy their software from disk to disk and all the different layouts and formats that these different machines used. So they did it all serially. Basically they had a master machine and then every machine had a, a slave serial communication program using for example Xmodem or Modem 7 um, to transfer files between them over a serial port and then let the machine write it out to disk itself. So that's exactly what I did here. Now in the day you would have done it directly from machine to machine. I did it from machine to PC and then PC back to the machine. Um, so the program that I ran on the Altair 680, I called PC get and PC put. Those are basically X modem send, X modem receive. And I could save those to disk because I had them in S record format and um, I had saved the save command out to disk already. Once I had those in place, I could take files off the 6800, put them on the PC, and then upload them to the 680. Again, in the day you would have just just done it directly between the two machines. But I wanted those utilities anyway. And so then I was able to build up a disk and now we're ready to go ahead and demo um, Flex booting off of this disk. Now, this video has gotten kind of long, so I think what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and cut this off here and we will start the next video just booting and demonstrating Flex on this 680.